That is, I can't tell you. So, so April and I are, we are ministering in Grafton, Wisconsin. It's about 20 minutes north of Milwaukee there in Wisconsin. And our church's name is Cedar Creek Community Church. Very similar to Hollywood Community Church. I can't tell you how many times I've started our services there saying, good morning, Hollywood Community Church. <laughs> always getting corrected. So I was terrified that today, the one time I could say that, I was going to say good morning, Cedar Creek Community Church. But good morning. It's so, so exciting to be with you today, HCC. Before we get any further, I need to introduce you to somebody. All right. This is the newest addition to our family. This is little Titus James, who was born on October 15th. Um, Titus James Burkholder, he already has a, a preacher's name, so he's going to be pounding on the pulpit soon. That's right. But right now he's going to go to sleep, I think. My sermons put him to sleep, so. Well, again, it is a joy to be with you. As, as many of you know, um, my wife, April, um, and my daughter, Sophia, moved to Wisconsin about a year and a half ago to minister to the people there in Grafton, Wisconsin, taking over the pastorate at a church called Cedar Creek Community Church. It has been a joy. It's been a journey. There have been so many challenges. There have been so many excitements. Um, but God is truly at work there. I want you to know that that congregation truly views you all as family, views you all as kingdom partners. They love you all. We pray for you often. We care about you. And we're so excited to see what God is doing through HCC here in this church and throughout the city of Hollywood and South Florida. So we're praying for you. We're, we're in this with you. And we're so excited for what God is doing here. For those of you who have no idea who I am, my name is Mark Burkholder. I was on staff here about a year and a half ago, like I said. And I want you to know that if you're just here, you're checking out this church, you found your home. This church will love you. This church will. This church will love you. They will care for you. They'll walk through the challenges and difficulties of life with you. I had the privilege of experiencing that firsthand. You all, this congregation, played such a part in my development and my preparation for ministry so that I could confidently go to another context there in Wisconsin um, and, and lead a church um, and have the success and, and wonderful things that we've been able to do there. So thank you genuinely from the bottom of my heart for the role that you've played in mine, April, in our family's life and thus in our ministry's life as well. So thank you. We, um, we are going to be just continuing the series that you all have been going through. Um, it is a story. We're telling the story of the king. Last week, for those of you who were here, you heard the beginning of the story. You heard how, how God created humanity, and you heard the story up through the, the prophets and the prophecy of the future hope that would come. Today, if you have your Bibles, if you don't mind pulling them out, you can go ahead and turn to the book of Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. And then you can turn the page. And there should be a blank page here. This is where we're going to be spending our time today, in the blank page. Last week, they dealt with the entire Old Testament. Next week, they're going to be dealing with the entire New Testament. But to handle this blank page, they needed to call in an expert. So that's why I'm here. The blank page is a very significant piece within our scripture. You may not realize this, but there was a significant time period before or after Malachi and before Matthew. We may have the tendency to think that right after Malachi finished writing, Matthew took up the pen and continued the story. But there is a time period of about 400 years in between the two Testaments. You may have experienced as you read through the Old Testament and then as you read through the New Testament, they seem like two completely different worlds. The things that seem to be the norm in the Old Testament are no longer the norm in the New Testament. And that's because of this significant period, the intertestamental period that it's called between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So although this may just be a blank page in our Bibles, it signifies a very important time and a very big piece to the story of the king. 
this is what we're going to be dealing with today. But before we jump into the story, can I pray with you all? Father, I am blown away with the opportunity to stand before this beautiful congregation, to gather with these incredible people and to open up your word, to see what you have in store for us. Father, we pray that your spirit does a work. I, I fully recognize and acknowledge that my words in and of themselves are so futile. I realize that my efforts, my study accomplish nothing apart through the transformative work of your spirit. So, Father, I, I plead that your spirit transforms our lives this morning. That your spirit does a work in my heart. Your spirit points out the areas of growth in my life, giving me the strength, the power, and it all changing me from the inside. We surrender this time to you. May you be honored and glorified in it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Hopelessness, frustration, terror, loneliness, they, they must have all set in. You see, they had been waiting 400 years. And in response, silence. 400 years is a long time. 400 years ago, Pocahontas had just died. Jamestown was still a new colony by the name of James Fort and was struggling to survive. Our country's establishment was still 150 years away, and the Enlightenment in Europe was still a distant dream for some. 400 years is certainly a long time. Now imagine 400 years without hearing from the God that you worship daily. The emotions, the questions must have welled up in their prayer life, leading to an urgent, urgent plea for help, but then leading to fading doubt that things would actually change. Where was the king? The king was missing. Last week, you heard the story of God's people from creation to a prophetic hope for the future. God had continually communicated with his people, whether it be through specific leaders like Moses or Abraham, or whether it was through the judges or the prophets or through visions. The communication line was open. That is until God used the prophet Malachi to say these words in Malachi chapter 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. You may catch it, but that chapter is a message of hope. God is sending someone who will take away our pain, someone who will restore our joy, who will finally give us freedom. They most certainly thought that that king would be there any day. I mean, it had been 500 years since King David reigned over the great nation. Certainly, it was now time for this new king. So they waited with hope-filled anticipation. Surely, the king would look on us with compassion and come to preserve his people. 
But years turned into decades, and still no sign of the king. As the years passed, their confidence in the coming king must have gradually faded. Nearly a hundred years after God spoke through Malachi, Aristotle's student, a, a man named Alexander the Great, came and conquered the land of Israel in his conquest for world domination. My, how the Israelites must have scoffed at his name. Alexander the Great? They realized that truly the only one who was the great was the great I am. But where was he? They hadn't heard or seen from him in years. Yet this Alexander the Great was accomplishing everything that the Israelite nation had always dreamed of. This was supposed to be their success. Instead, they were once again someone else's property. But this was far from the end. You see, Alexander died off and God's people became like a ping pong ball bouncing back and forth between the control of Alexander's former generals. All the while, the God of the Jews, whom they claimed was the most powerful being, was seemingly ignoring them and absent. Where was the king? The suppression continued as did the silence of their Savior. One would almost feel embarrassed to call out to a God who is silent. The very culture of the Hebrew people seemed to be a fleeting wind as the Greek culture came and took over. You see, people were no longer speaking Hebrew, they were speaking Greek. The scriptures had now been translated into Greek. The culture and way of living was not Hebrew, but it was now Greek. While some of the more passionate Jews, the Hasidians and the Pharisees, fought this, they ultimately failed. How could the creator of such a great nation just sit back and watch all of his work fade away under the power of a man? Surely God would soon restore his nation. How could it get any worse? It does. It gets a lot worse. You see, in about 175 BC, a man named Antiochus Epiphanes rose to power over much of the land, including the land of Israel. Epiphanes, meaning manifestation, got his name because he claimed that he was the manifestation of God on earth. The title of the very thing that the Israelite people had longed for was being used to entrap and destroy them. See, this Epiphanes guy wasn't just an ordinary guy. Many people think he was delusional. He hated the Jewish people. He was adamant in proving that their God was nothing compared to him. Surely this would be the thing that would draw the king into the story. Surely this would be the thing that would cause God to act. Instead, there was silence. Epiphanes made it illegal for anyone to possess Hebrew scriptures. He made it illegal to circumcise your children. He made temple sacrifices to God illegal. He set up a massive statue to Zeus, which actually looked like Antiochus Epiphanes, right outside of the temple. He completely destroyed everything that was there. And if you don't think it can get any worse, he took it one step further. He had pigs who were unclean animals, according to Jewish tradition, sacrificed on the holy altars that were once meant for the one true God. This truly was an abomination of desolation. So severe that we see Daniel in the Old Testament prophesy about this very instance. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, he says, Forces from him, the desolator, shall appear and profane the temple and fortress, and shall take away the regular burnt offering, and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. The very picture of God 
on earth. The temple had been desolated, demolished. And God's response? Silence. The king was missing. And the kingdom was being demolished. With God being silent, the people thought that they might take matters into their own hands. Appalled by what was happening, a man named Matthias and his five sons rose up in protest, leading a, a revolt led by Jacob, Judas Maccabeus, the, Jacob, the Maccabean revolt. Judas Maccabeus meaning Judas the hammer. After several years of genius military strategy, they were able to recover many of the Jewish rites, including the reopening of the temple for Jewish worship. Finally, God's people were victorious. This reopening led to a massive eight-day feast and celebration, one that is continually remembered today, that is remembered this week in Hanukkah. Was this God finally making his presence known? Would the Israelites finally be the great nation that they were once promised? Had God finally fulfilled his promises? Certainly, this was finally the end of their captivity. And it was for about 80 years. But then a man who many of you might recognize, Pompey, conquered Israel for Rome. And under the Roman domination, Oedipus and Mark Anthony tasked a man that you may recognize from Scripture, Herod the Great, with being the king of the Jews. But he was not a faithful Jew. He was cruel. He was a traitor. The true Israel despised him. Yet he ruled as king of of the Jews in selfishness. While the Jews waited for their true king, the king who was silent, the king who was missing. Can you imagine the angst, the frustration, the lack of a hope that the people of Israel must have been facing? Here they believed and proclaimed that their God would deliver them, but instead was silent. He was missing. They must have felt betrayed or lied to. Where was the God that their ancestors had spoken of? Where was the God who promised to deliver them? Where was the God who promised a great king because this king was missing? They must have felt alone as days passed, as they faced the tragedies that life brought, as they felt their very identity being ripped away at the hand of those claiming to be God. Where was the king? I don't know about you, but I could never imagine the sense of emptiness and a hopelessness that they must have felt. But it's interesting, we do see this sentiment elsewhere in the pages of Scripture. While not 400 years, the three days of silence where the disciples experienced angst, frustration, and hopelessness as their Savior was dead, it was a picture of true hopelessness. The one whom they entrusted with everything, their proposed savior was dead. And for three days again, God was silent. The disciples were filled with similar emotions of loneliness, hopelessness. But much like those 400 years, the silence that they experienced was broken. The darkness was eliminated through the Christ both times. Once from the womb of a virgin, yet again through the womb of the earth. Once through birth, yet again through rebirth. Once in a cave meant for animals, yet again in a cave meant for death. 
Both times, life came out of death. Light came out of darkness. Hope came out of hopelessness. During the silence, a man who considered himself the manifestation of God made an unclean sacrifice to defile the temple of God. But some 200 years later, the true incarnate God would make the final ultimate sacrifice, tearing the veil within the temple. One defiled, the other fulfilled. It is through the word that dwelt among us that God breaks his silence, proclaiming the hope of the gospel into each and every one of our lives. The silent night that was experienced in Bethlehem was broken through the cries of a baby savior. Church, hear me when I say this. Christ is light in the midst of your darkness. He is hope in the midst of your hopelessness. He is joy in the midst of your despair. This blank page isn't simply a blank page. This blank page magnifies the red letters that are to follow. You see, I'm I'm sure... I'm sure that each of you are going through your own challenges, some of which are so much greater than I could ever understand, some more severe than others, maybe the loss of someone special, and maybe difficulties with your finances, a relationship in tension, just the stresses of life weighing down on you. You look at the hopelessness that encompassed that 400 years and you cry out, that's me. The king is missing. As you lay in bed at night, you don't know how you can face another day and you cry out with the Israelites, where is the king? If that's you, please hear this. The silence has been broken. You have the beauty of opening up this life-giving book and hearing from the God who longs for you. You have the privilege of openly calling out to the King of Kings, being confident that he hears your prayer. Some of you may be here today. This is all new for you. You've never called out to God. You've never heard from him. Your life has simply been a picture of this silence. Know that God loves you so much that he wants to break the silence in your life. He so longs to hear from you. Quiet out the rest of the voices in the world and hear his call this morning. Be still and know that he is God. One of the many things that we tell our congregation there in Wisconsin is that life is hard, don't do it alone. We have the tendency to face the tragedies and the challenges of life by ourselves while closing everybody out. But know that the Lord of the universe desires to commune with you. Call out to him in the midst of your loneliness. Cry out to him in the midst of your pain. In 1744, the brilliant hymn writer Charles Wesley penned the words to my favorite Christmas hymn. I'd like you to catch the words this morning. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in thee. Israel, strength and consolation, hope 
of all the earth, thou art dear desire of every nation, joy of every longing heart. joy of every longing heart. I don't know about you, that's me. I cry out in the midst of my heartache, in the midst of my despair, knowing that I can't face this life alone. And I call out in my longings, with a longing heart saying, God, where are you? But hear me, the silence has been broken. You have hope in the midst of your hopelessness. You have joy in the midst of your despair. You have love in the midst of a situation where you may feel unloved. Be still and know that he is God. Know that he is calling out to you. The silence that seems to be encompassing you from every side has been vanquished. It is gone. There's a God who calls out to you in his love, in his grace, in his encouragement, in his hope in the midst of your hopelessness. Would you stand with me this morning? Life is incredibly difficult. As much as we would love to say that the silence has been broken, the difficulties of life are through, that's just not true. We call out to God in our hopelessness. We call out to God in our despair. We continue to struggle through the difficulties of life. This calling out to God isn't a one-time thing. This life is intended to bring us to our knees so that we don't rely on our strength, but we rely on his. The story of the king may seem like one that is filled with darkness and tragedy, but the story is not over. Amen. Christmas is coming. The cross is coming. The future glory we get to sit hand in hand, worshiping the God who has saved us from our despair is coming. Let us pray. Father, we come to you in our hopelessness. We come to you in our hurt, recognizing that there is nothing in us that can save us. Recognizing that you are our only hope. We need you, Father. Thank you for calling out to us and breaking the silence of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.